The Football Pod on OTB Sports in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the GAA Senior Football Championship. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. You're all very welcome along to what is now episode 18 of The Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue. Lads, it's been a very busy day of sport. We are recording on a Sunday today. Paddy, Liverpool just couldn't get over the line. It was touch and go, wasn't it? I thought they might make it. Um, an almighty collapse from Aston Villa in the last 15 minutes. Um, yeah, I'm a United fan anyway, so we were beaten yet again today for about the hundred times this season. So put that one to bed and get the new manager in and try and turn it around. But fair play to City. Yeah, they nicked it in the end. Yeah, James, it was more uh, a Man City comeback than a Villa collapse, wasn't it? A bit of oh, the owner bringing Gundogan off the bench. A bit of both, like. But when they brought Gundogan on, I was like, he ain't going to score. And in fairness, he got two. Sterling probably made the difference, didn't he? Yeah. Jesus. Set it up. Neville, Neville, can't, bench. Nev- Nev- bench. <laughs> Neville can't help himself. He was just like, Gundogan, you little dancer. Yeah. 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 yeah he did. That's your look at that. Was it? Listen, apart from City winning the league today um, and the Talchin Cup kicking off this weekend, we have some big news to announce. Go on. Of course, going to Castle Bar on June the 2nd. We can oh, reveal. To all of the football pod listeners, that our special guest, one of our special guests on the night, is going to be your old foe and the Mayo legend, Keith Higgins. Well, Higgins, Higgins, you know for that fella, Jesus. Zippy. So we're gonna we're gonna reenact the greatest battle, James. I don't know who against Keith Higgins, Paddy. <laughs> who won I remember that? watching it at the time? I was watching it on the couch at home, looking at Jimmy, peak Jimmy, peak Higgins as well. To be fair to him. It was a, it was a, it's a funny one though when you read back in it, like because it's one of those things that's been written about as being the ep, one of the epic battles. And unless you really dig into the games and watch them back, it's hard to tell. And it's, I think it's because of you experienced it in real time. And James, I know you experienced it in, in, in the game itself, but when you experienced it in real time, there was moments when Higgins was, was on top, there was moments when O'Donoghue was on top, and then at the end of the game, you look at the sheet and it's James O'Donoghue two six, and Kerry have won. So when you're looking back at it then a couple of years later, it's it's kind of hard. But James, at the time, like that was yourself and Keith, Bodie is flying at the top of your games, going toe to toe against each other. It was pretty exciting stuff. It was. <clears throat> I suppose when you're in the moment of it, when you're losing a ball and winning a ball and losing a ball, it actually does focus you even more just to think about the next one because like you can't let the mistake get on top of you because he beat me out to a couple. What he was doing was marking me from the front, and I was trying yeah. to to beat him out to him and he he caught me out in front a couple of times and then I just snuck in back door a few times behind him yeah and, yeah, and, and caught him out so it was one of those it was complete a complete mental battle trope because it you know if I if I let one or two mistakes get to me he would have absolutely beat me out the gate and then we got it we got a couple of penalties like so so well, I, I was lucky to come out on top it was more of a, an even one I think really yeah it wasn't it wasn't even the penalties it was nearly like you got that ball early on in, in Limerick and Higgins makes this unbelievable Superman block. You go yeah. for goal and Donahue's just Donahue's there. Goal, the, yeah. the jammy finishing off the back of it. Like, so whatever Keith ended up doing, but there is a little highlights package that anyone who's there in the night in Castle Bar may get a little teaser of, of Higgins actually dispossessing you about 12 times in the game and you taking <laughs> and beating him. It's, it's not well, bad. Yeah, it's not. Well, well, just, just when I say like experiencing it in real time, I, I had a little look back on, on Twitter I, I searched in August 30th, 2014, and I typed in James O'Donoghue's name and Keith Higgins' name. And a couple of interesting tweets came up. So this is nearly like experiencing the game in real time again. At Owen. It's nearly like at Owen. <coughs> I think his name is. Keith Higgins versus James O'Donoghue. An unreal battle. Gillian Murphy pipes in. Keith Higgins is brilliant. Some battle between him and James O'Donoghue, two of the best players in the country. This is great to watch. Jerry Moriarty, about 15 minutes later. Hey, Jerry. James O'Donoghue. And Keith Higgins has been amazing. Two of the best players in the country in their positions going toe-to-toe. Daniel Bannon, 10 minutes into the first half. Help me. James O'Donoghue sent from deep inside Keith Higgins' back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> ben Murray. Unbelievable <laughs> battle between James O'Donoghue and Keith Higgins. Masterclass on both ends. What a game. Damian Mullen jumps in. What a great tussle between O'Donoghue and Higgins. The whole of Twitter was falling out over this. Keith Higgins. Versus James O'Donoghue, what a battle. Higgins with three unreal blocks and Donoghue still doing very well. Who will win? Question mark. That's about 10 minutes into the second half. Darren Mulvey is back. Actually, no, he hasn't been on already. Darren Mulvey's in this is going. 
James O'Donoghue is going to need a flashlight to find his way out of Keith Higgins' pockets. Mayo versus Kerry. We can invite these lads to the bar next week. I'm telling you. James Horan says after the match that Keith Higgins got the better of James O'Donoghue. That's in the first game, the first game around, when James got that late goal. So I it know was real... why wasn't Mark him in the first day. It was, it was, um, was a Kniff and, and Higgins doubled up on you, though. I think that's what it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe. I think that's what it Kniff was. Kniff was um, sweeping, yeah. yeah. They went yeah. against... Oh, no, 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 Jimmy. What's that? No one can handle it. <laughs> well, you, you, were, you came into that first game against against uh, Mayo in 14 off the back of back-to-back man of the match performances against Cork and Galway in Croker. Um, so, you know, your your form was pretty hot that, that week coming into it. Just to leave it with this, Niall McNamee, all-star performance from Keith Higgins and James O'Donoghue has 2-6. What a battle. So we're going to be talking But about I always that. say, like, the forward only needs a couple of moments, whereas yeah. the back needs 70 75 minutes like it the, the cards are in the for, in the forwards hands like and if you can stick it out mentally to just go right next one now I'll, I'll do the right thing i'll get a chance and those games were open like like keith higgins never sat back and started calling the wing backs to sit in front of him or anything like that he was too honest he was like i'm going to go toe to toe with this fella and beat him that's so what like, they were like though jimmy wasn't it that's all those bad defenders keith was obviously yeah. a legend for them but that was it it was like they had total confidence in themselves. And that allowed them to play the way oh, they, they play. Yeah. Was Higgins marking you in that total performance from Paddy Andrews in the 2015 All-Ireland semi-final replay? I don't think he really was. A lot of people said this to me. It was, it was kind of, Cafferkey was on me for a bit. Mm. Alan Boyle was on for a bit. Like, I kind of floated around as well. So it wasn't, I remember reading about this and people said, oh, Paddy Andrews and Keith Higgins. Like, I wasn't really on Keith for a lot of it. There might have been certain <laughs> plays, but like, Remember, football, even at that time, was starting to become really fluid. Like It wasn't like the old school, you're marking him, and that's it. Players were moving around the pitch. I was going out to send the forward, going out the way we kind of played. We weren't just staying rigidly in our position. So there was definitely a couple of players where it would have been on key to put. Yeah. Um, Moments, I suppose, in games. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't like it wasn't like what a man marketing thing that he would have had with James. Like, yeah. Well, it's, it's actually a year later. Shane Walsh tweets, August the 30th. 2015, 3.56 p.m. This is the Galway footballer Shane Walsh. Paddy Andrews has clearly spent a lot of time on the dance floor. He's after leaving Keith Higgins for dead. Hashtag <laughs> dead. So I have to Shane Walsh Shane playing for Galway now. Yes, yes, yes. So That's too easy on himself. Back in, back in 2015. <laughs> yeah, so like, like geez, when you, when you break down Keith Higgins' his, his records, like, and the thing is, I delayed announcing Higgins because he was playing in the Christy Ring Cup final this weekend for, for Mayo. <laughs> They're beating by Calera. It's, it's incredible, like, what he's done. 90... National Football League appearances, 75 in the championship, eight Connacht titles, one National Football League. He was the captain of the under-21 team back in 2006 when the Connacht Championship and the All-Ireland. Um, won a Sigerson Cup with Sligo in 2005. Four All-Stars. I think he's the only Mayo player to win three in a row, 12, uh, 12 13, 14. Won another one in 17. Young footballer of the year, 06. And obviously a very talented hurler. Still hurling for Mayo. They lost at the weekend, but he's won two Nicky Racker Cups in 16 and 21, and he was named the Nicky Racker Herd of the Year in 2021. When you talk about uh, defenders needing to have, you know, a full game and be on it for the for your entire match, one of the m- craziest games we had in the last 20-odd years of Gaelic football was Dublin Mayo in 2006. And going by all reports and watching back the game that day, Bernard Brogan got the better of Keith Higgins for about 65, 66 minutes that day. Um, well, it was, it was Alan. Would it have been Alan in 06? 2006. Yeah, would it have been Alan? Or Alan. Bernard it probably would have been. No, it, was, it was Alan, yeah. It was Alan. But yeah. in the 67th minute, that epic Kieran McDonald winner, who yeah. is it driving 60 yards at the ball? It's Keith Higgins. He realises that he's not going to score off his left foot, flicks it to Kevin O'Neill, flicks it to Kieran Mack, ball goes over the bar. So uh, he got credit that day for sticking with it, even though he got a bit of a bit of a tough day so I can't wait you to speak what, to Higgins you know what would be an interesting chat with him is <clears throat> we talked a lot about conditioning mm. and gym and all that like Keith never struck me as a fella who was unbelievably gym based strong but my yeah. god if he got his hand in there was no shaking at really all. yeah, yeah. wiry like he was yeah, yeah. he yeah. was wiry in such a strong wiry way but he never got bulky that he lost his agility then do you know um, be interesting to see what, what he how he did that is it right? Right? He caused us a lot of trouble playing at centre forward in yeah. 2013 all the final. And I think they moved him for some reason. Like I think he scored two points in the first half. We were really struggling. Like we we didn't play well that day. A, a bird kind of got us out of jail with a couple of goals. 
But uh, I think they moved him back for some reason. I'd be interested to see what he thought about that. Like that was a uh, because he was he was a handful for us in that first half. Like Mayor on top, but yeah, he was causing havoc. Up that front. was a tactic against G for a while, then because we put Paul Murphy in the forwards. Yeah. Well, why was that? What, what well, were you he played forwards for his club? In fairness, to him. he played for Ratmore yeah. centre forward, but and he was brilliant. So he played a year up there. I right. suppose you can get back, vacate the eleven spot to be running into. But I always think if you have an eleven that the opposition have to mark, yeah, then you have a hole in the middle of your of your defence. You have to fill it with someone else, and then that man out the field is free. Yeah. Rather than if you sacrifice your your eleven, I think nowadays. It doesn't work as well. I don't know why it doesn't work to treat back then. Oh, that Jimmy, that's going to be interesting next week in the Leicester final because mm. Bam McCormick is needs to be picked up. Yes. and lots of teams against Dublin have dropped forwards back to kind of help their defence, and that allows a Kato Sullivan or a Johnny Cooper or Brian Howard last week to sit free. That plays in the Dublin's hands, so Claire won't allow that to happen next week. Someone is going to have to man Mark Ben McCormick, probably John Small. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how that affects that defensive structure. Look, we'll talk about that. But uh, Definitely. But if yeah. that was Dublin a couple of years ago, they'd take Ben McCormick for a run. Yeah. yeah. It'd be interesting now to see if they attack him that way. Like, put yeah. someone on him, take him up the field. I tell you what, he, down and then switch the man on him, bring he, him up the field again. He was, he was very impressive last week, even against Westmead. He got two or three turnovers back in his own half as well. So he can do that sort of things as yes, well. He can, he can. He was, uh, he was the standout player last week. So Kildare be looking for a big game of him next week. But it'd be interesting to see that dynamic. Who picks him up at Dublin? What's Kildare's plan to try and disrupt that defensive shape that Dublin have? So, um, yeah, I, I just remember talking about Keith. He caused a serious trouble that day back yeah. in. Nine, nine years ago now, Jesus. Yeah, he yeah. would be a good guest. He'll be well played. He will. He'll be great. He'll be great crack. And um, I'm sure you have a little bit of backup from a, a Mayo colleague on the night as well. And all the Mayo oh. fans in Castle Bar will obviously be cheering him on. So can't wait for that. One of the interesting things as well about Higgins is he credits Andy Moran for his Mayo career in a lot of ways. Because when they're in college together in Sligo, Andy was the one plaguing him to come down the road for training. And yeah. Higgins had no interest in it. He didn't want to wanted to stay up in Sligo. And he was dragged down. He ended up becoming crack was 19 Sligo. Must have been. So we, we, we have a bit of crack about that in the night as well and figure out what exactly happened. So um, that's that. So we're really excited. That's June 2nd, Castle Bar. Nice one. Huh? Ticketmaster for tickets or the uh, otbsports.com forward slash events. So mm-hmm. we are going to be talking about the four provincial finals this weekend, as the lads mentioned. There's also seven Talchin Cup games that we're going to get predictions off you for. Um, what else? Oh, the qualifier draw was made. We're going to get stuck into that in a moment. But first, first, I want to talk about the Talchin Cup, which launched this weekend. We had two games. We had Wicklow 316, Waterford 110. Hard luck, James. You tried to back your fellow Munster men. Just didn't happen for them. I feel like me and Paddy talked you into that one last week. Um, it was two early goals in the second half from Kevin Quinn, who finished up at 2-1, and Owen Darcy. That kind of drove Wicklow along. Former Dublin panellist, an old teammate of yours, Paddy, Nicky Devereaux was starting for Wicklow oh, this yeah. weekend. Yeah, so he... Did, would Nicky have won in All-Ireland? Like, he was, he was yeah, an All-Ireland like, under-21 All-Ireland would, winner. Uh, he would have been on the panel. I think he's a couple of All-Irelands. He was on yeah. the panel. With Gilroy and also Gavin in 14. With Pat and then in James. And he played. I, he, he would have been playing that day against Tony Gall in 2014. Okay. That is this day, yeah. So now he, he, Nicky would have a couple of All-Irelands, all right. Balotier was his club. Mm. Uh, so... I think his dad is a Wicklow native and his brother obviously played with him as well. But what he was a wing back, really. He was in the mold of a... Yeah, like, lightning that, fast. Lightning, he, okay. Relentlessly fast. <laughs> yeah. Running after him a couple of times. But uh, no, he, he would have had a good career with double yeah. yeah, it's interesting. Um, you'd wonder would that ever catch on enough. Obviously, Connor Cox went from Kerry to Roscommon. There's a couple of players all around the country yeah. playing with different counties. But uh, clearly, there's a uh, plenty of dubs in the background that could easily play in, in different yeah. counties you know it's, it's never there's never really been a huge amount of transfers but like there's there's little ones dotted around the country there's James, three there's three Temple No fellas in Kerry playing yes in different counties. that's crazy yeah, for them, for tip, they're playing for different counties playing for Tip Sligo Te- Teddy Doyle with Tip yeah um, Spallan Jr. with Sligo yeah, yeah he's due to you. and there's another one well you've obviously got the Kerry boys the Kerry boys I think there's one Morley more. Morley is Adrian Splank Killian Are they both? Yeah. 
Temple they're all they're all Temple Nine. I yeah. think it's all five. Yeah. So yeah, that's and that's Gavin it. Crowley. So they've Gavin Crowley, Tyg Morley, Adrian Spillane, Killian Spillane, and then Teddy Doyle and Spillane. I think there's another one. They've they have seven into county fellas. It's outrageous. <laughs> that's unbelievable. And they were they were junior All Ireland champions in sixteen, wasn't it? Yeah. So the other big game, Wexford had beaten them in the Leinster Championship. But today, Offaly went down to Enniscorthy and they won by 3.11 to 2.13. They held off Wexford. Wexford had the win later on. They were pushing for an equaliser, just didn't get enough. It was a tight first half. Lee Pearson, an under-20 All-Ireland winner, probably the first crop from Offaly's under-20 All-Ireland winners to properly start for them, a wing back. Really, he started cornerback today. He had a big impact. He cleared a goal chance off the line in the first half, scored a really good goal in the start of the second half, put Offaly into the perfect position. Wexford dragged them back into it. But Niall McNamee, Ends up a 1-5. You know, he, he had a big impact. He may not have had his sharpest day, but he had a big impact. That's all that matters. Scored 1-5. Barry's a brilliant goal with about 15 minutes to go. Niall McNamee made his debut, lads, back in 2003 for Offaly when he was 17 years old. 2003? Oh, my God. Outrageous. Like. He's 36 years old now, and he's still doing it. Do you feel any bit like two boys in their early 30s? That Could, I, could we just have hung on a little bit more? No. Would you... No, <laughs> <laughs> Max no. Dodd. Absolutely not. Uh, no, he look, he's incredible. We spoke about him before on this pod. Uh, two for two for predictions, by the way, for us. Tommy, yes, we we'll start to our Talchin Cup. I expected Athlete to win, and um, just because of that, like Shane Roach has done a, done a good job at Wexford, but I, I expected Athlete to come through that one and get a bit of a bounce in the Talchin Cup because of players like Mac. If you have guys that can put the ball over the bar, you have a chance. And he is one of the best in the business. He's been doing it, like you say, for nearly 20 years. Um, just that bit of class, and it makes such a difference. Um, and they're always going to have a chance. They'd be dangerous in the Talton Cup. That's why it was interesting to see. I know we, we, we looked at the boss Shay's comments that maybe awfully weren't overly enamored with the competition, but that's a good start for them. They play Wicklow now next week. They could do damage in the Talton Cup. And if they are going to do it, it'd be players like McNamee. He's so important for them, not just for scoring exploits but like for a lot of that under 20 team to come through he's a figurehead for off GA. he's kind of set the standards going look, this is what it's all about so he'll have a massive influence in the dressing room as well but to be still kicking scores on the pitch like he is um it's just top class credit where it's due james you don't qualify for any other counties do you i'll check it out now it might go to london or new york right <laughs> <laughs> they all could be nice though, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Hey, when you see the games, like you do be like, Oh, I wish I was still involved. When I was up in Park Arena all the last day, and the pitch was oh, it was unbelievable. And it was it was so intimate in terms of the, the crowd and everything. Mm. It was a case of oh, I do miss it. But I suppose there is there's so much to it. Like that that hour and a half is a tiny piece of the year. Do you know what I mean? That's so much effort for that. Like, but yeah, pa- Paddy, I've sat beside you for quite a few games in the last eighteen months since you've been retired. I've never got the sense that you've wanted to be back out there. No, because <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I you do. Is it, what is it? Is it, is, it, is, it, is it the sheer physical? No, I, no, I just I I did it. I did yeah. it for long enough. Like for around thirteen years at Dublin, Jesus, seventeen or eighteen playing senior with the club. Um, I don't have the hunger for it you know maybe that's I remember talking to Andy about this as well Andy obviously played quite late uh, he hung on for, for a long time and they were kind of chasing all Ireland and stuff and I was very fortunate to be part of a team that we had success so I wasn't sitting around going Geez, I need to go back for one more year to win another all Ireland like, I was very privileged to be part of that team that we we had and we won a lot of a lot of medals and a lot of trophies so there was no external motivation for me to hang on, and then internally as well. I was just like James is right. Yeah, it's it's you'd go into Crow Park and he'd love to kick a few scores and that, but there's about nine yeah. months of work that goes in behind that. Um, and I had done that and I was ready to go. And also a little bit as well, like you know you're finished as well. Like like if I said I wanted to go back, I'd say Desi put a pull me aside and tell me to piss off as well. So, you know. There's a time when you're not good enough anymore as well. And I would have felt that towards the end of my last season as well. So okay. I definitely, definitely, definitely do not miss it. I enjoy watching it uh, and supporting the lads, but God, no. It's good. It drag me onto a pitch. It's good to have peace with it. That's that's a really good thing yeah. as well. It'd be worse if you were sitting here going, oh, I'd way rather be out there. And James, I'm not surprised that you, 
you feel a, felt a bit of that that night down in Parky Rain, but I presume yeah. that's something that might dissipate a little bit as the months go on. Surely, but you know, it's just as important of, of like being involved. You have to walk away at the right time. Like if you go, if you hang on too late, it actually, it kind of makes you think about the whole, your whole career negatively. If you go, if you yeah. go too long, do you know, you have to go. Like if you can get that sweet spot, it just makes it way better. Do you know? Like, I think I think it'll be one question we'll be asking Keith Higgins on the night on June 2nd in Castlebar as well, because a lot of people feel like Higgins could have got minutes that night in 2020 in December when Dublin bet Mayo in that All-Ireland final. And he's still obviously, yeah. you know, putting it I in for Mayo, putting on a Mayo jersey. Him. Yeah, so look, at, know, with, into that night as well. With McNamee, like he has something, he has something, a goal, like he has a target. And like the feel-good factor on Offaly, hurling and football at the moment, like yeah. everyone wants to be a part of that. Like what Michael Dagen has done up there is unbelievable. Like he's got this wave of enthusiasm. So no one wants to walk away from that setup. No. You know, so like I think if they could win that Telton Cup, it would be unbelievable for them. They just need, they need to just check off a couple of victories, a couple of trophies to really ignite the whole thing. And they're doing a great job already, to be fair. Right. We've buried the lead. The qualifier draw. Let's get into it. Probably did hate Mayo, or we thought it was hate at the time, because these guys are trying to take away our dreams. The Football Pod, live. Thursday, June 2nd, in Castle Bar. Check out otbsports.com forward slash events and get your tickets now. For any of our YouTube viewers, you'll have copped it fairly quickly that, yeah, okay, we, we have edited it here. I tried to tell the lads to wear the same clothes. Paddy's in a suit. I'm obviously <laughs> looking like I didn't sleep at all. We recorded 90% of the podcast about 18 hours ago, 12 hours ago, we'll say, at uh, Sunday night. But the qualifier draw has just been made, and we had guessed that we were going to need to hop on to have a bit of a chat and a reaction to it. James, you're about to hop on a flight shortly, are you? Sure am. Carry to Alicante. Carry to Alicante. <laughs> you have a lovely little week before you're back, before the weekend with all the provincial finals. You're getting I just nice put on my first layer of bronzer there. Oh, fair play, boy. And now that you look different, you be. Yeah. I'd say you'll tan well. <laughs> no, okay, the qualifier draw. I'm sure you've all heard it because it's brilliant. First team out of the hat, Mayo. They're playing Monaghan. It's in Castlebar. You've no excuse not to be at the show, Monaghan people, on Thursday night. We will see you there. A couple of tickets left. I'll put the tweet out. But we have announced Keith Higgins, so I'd say they could be snapped up fairly quickly. Arma versus Tyrone in the Athletic Grounds. Oh, I see. Cork versus Loud in Parky Cueve, if Ed Sheeran allows it. And the tie of the round, Clare versus Mead. Who are you oh, going for there? I have my half and half jersey. I'm going to oh, imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. imagine. Um, geez, lads, it's a, it's a good draw. Couldn't got much better. Yeah, well, look, like, you knew the teams in it. You expected at least one blockbuster game. We probably got two, really. Our man, Tyrone. We'll probably grab most of the headlines back from their, their National League fixture back in yeah. February in the, in the Athletic Road, which was um, remembered for probably all the wrong reasons at the end of that. That's a massive, massive game for both of those teams. They, Tyrone were coming off, obviously, winning the All-Ireland last year. It was going to be a big ask to see how they could back that up. Armagh had a really impressive start to the league campaign. There's no doubt their season's kind of petered out a bit. And one of those teams, whoever loses that, that is a bad season. Yeah. Whoever wins it mm. kind of catapults them right back into the mix into the All-Ireland Series. For Mayo, I think Mayo would have taken anyone once it was in Castlebar. They'd have fancied anyone, really. If they got a home draw, um, that would be a, a tricky, tricky game because Monaghan, Monaghan would be kicking themselves losing to Derry and had opportunities to win that game. But I think Mayo have had time to get back on the horse after that Galway game. And you expect a massive performance. I'd say that'll probably be a Saturday night, I'd imagine, in Castlebar. Oh, really? And it will be a full house, a big week in Castlebar that week. So um, I think they're, they're the two standout games, obviously. But uh, yeah, a pretty tasty draw. I think that's a great shout. Under lights, Saturday night, or even oh, closer. Awesome. Now, it wouldn't be under lights. It wouldn't be under lights. But Saturday evening in Castlebar, dust coming in. I think that's a great shout. It is. If you look at all those games, right, every single team thinks they can win their game yeah. like there's yeah. no there's no one that's going oh we got an awful draw there like obviously our man Tyrone if you asked either team before the draw you'd say we don't want that game yeah. but they're still thinking we can win this and ignite our year so it's a tough one 
Cork and Load, Cork are going to be under savage pressure there. They need to win that game. Clare and Meath is a toss of a coin at the moment. Um, both sides are kind of evenly matched. And Mayo Monaghan, I, the interesting thing about Mayo is what they've done with their time. Have they, have they improved over the couple of weeks they've had off? And will they, will they be able to match Monaghan who've had less time to kind of relax? Yeah, so... And also, like, game, to be fair. Because of the nature of the qualifiers this year, you're going to end up playing the loser of a provincial final in the next round. There yeah. is no gimmies here. There's no, you know, finding your form, finding your feet, getting through it. This is the only kind of game you want if you're a Mayo fan and a Mayo player. I think you need to see, can you beat Monaghan? And if you do, you're back in the mix. Yes. But like there, if you if you go by our predictions for the, the <laughs> provincials, <laughs> Like you, you shouldn't go with our predictions. Yeah, you shouldn't. <laughs> but you probably have, you fancy your chances in the, if you come through this round to beat one of those provincial losers. Um, so it's a huge character. That's the, the big thing, Jim. When you hit the nail on the head there, like, like Tyrone and Armagh is an interesting one because, look, ideal scenario, would they have wanted that game? There was easier toys to be had for both of those teams. But winning a game like that, that can put Tyrone, that can give momentum. That can give... Yeah, real buzz back to a season because both of those teams are so flat after their exits from the Ulster Championship and they would have been feeling very, very sorry for themselves and if they got, say, look, notice, like a loud or a mead at home, does that really tell them anything about themselves? Mm. Does that really give them the kick that they need? But for one of them, they're going to be out in the first week of June and that's going to be a hard one to take. But if you come through that game, Particularly that game, I, I think it's a massive kick uh, for, for whoever does come out of it. It's a hard one to call. It's a hard. I know Armagh won the league game convincingly. Well, Tyrone were, were very patchy, but you'd have to think Tyrone, like to be still the All Ireland champions, there has to be some sort of kick. Yeah. Out of them. The diabolical display against Derry. So, I'll, look, lads, it's they're, they're class times. It's it's beautiful. Um. I, I think it's Rory Cushnan tweeted me this morning, or Cushnan. Well, it seemed the throne draw coming. I wonder when the last time Throne lost twice in the Athletic Grounds in one year, and he, he tagged in the GA Stats account. GA Stats got back and said they've never, Armad never beaten them twice in the one year. So, you know, I wouldn't be reading a whole pile into that. I think it's going to go down to the wire. I think that, as you said, James, every other team is going to fancy their chances against each other. Mead have a Freakishly good record against Clare, and I think I've just jinxed it right there. Because Clare, who won due, that league game, Tommy? Mead won, 10, oh, huh? Mead won 10 9. It, it was a oh, drab, enough, drab enough affair, but was that on in Ennis? It was in Ennis, yeah. But Mead, have a, Mead have a freakishly good record against Clare over the last, they've had the hex on Clare over the last, uh, the last little while. So we just it all depends it. on what teams have done with their time. Like if they've, if they've dropped ahead or been disappointed with going out. That's going to do you no favours. Mm. You know, if they got back on the horse and prepared for this and they're buzzing going into the weekend, then they're well set. Whereas if the draws kind of come at them yeah. and they have a week now to, to gather the, the troops, it's not going to be enough. They're huge games. Like, they're so 50-50. Well, lads, I'm expecting Clare to win that one. At the Jordan moment. Morris, Jordan Morris is going to be missing for me as well. Yeah. They were, like I said, there was not one positive you could have taken from their, their performance against Dublin. And uh, Clare have had time, they would have been absolutely raging and losing on penalties to, to, to Limerick. Um, I, I, I just think I, I, I back Clare to win that one. The fact that I, it's in Ennis as well. Yeah, I haven't seen odds yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's uh, if it's going to be very, very close. I know you're saying there was no positives for Mead, but that's a, that's a good chance. It's a 50 50 game. They haven't drawn last year's It's, it's, it's a good draw for Mead. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it could have been a hell of a lot worse. So, so they'll much take so. it. But, so, yeah, uh, I think they're up against it. Castle Barfield is very, very real, lads. We just announced Keith Higgins. They've got Monaghan coming to town on the Saturday night, as Paddy said. Thursday, June 2nd, the Royal TF Theatre. We will see you all there. James O'Donoghue, enjoy Alicante. It's going to sound a little bit strange here on the football pod because it's going to sound like we're leaving you, but we're not. We're going to come back with the rest of our preview of next year's provincial finals. We'll be back with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue on episode 18 of the Football Pod right after these. It is, of course, brought to you by AIB, proud sponsors of the GEA Senior Football Championship. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Lads, I'll speak to you in about 15 seconds. <laughs> Magic. <laughs>
probably did hate Mayo, and we thought it was hate at the time because these guys are trying to take away our dreams. The Football Pod Live. Thursday, June 2nd in Castle Bar. Check out otbsports.com forward slash events and get your tickets now. You are very welcome back to episode 18 of the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and James O'Donoghue. Lads, we have got a feast of football on next weekend. The Champions League, for, I'm only joking. We have got four <laughs> provincial finals and we've got seven games in the Talchin Cup. The hurling is taking. So let's start in Pierce Stadium, 1.45 p.m. Sunday. There hasn't been very much talk about Roscommon on this podcast. Mm. And whenever there has been talk about Roscommon, <laughs> Paddy Andrews would be very quick. To... <laughs> the West Brom, the baggies of GA, I think is the, the one that I've had thrown back at me by Roscommon people I've met uh, out and about. They're not too happy with that, but I think they'll, they'll get on with it. Can the Rossi shut down Galway's key men, Paddy? I think they have a great chance of winning this game. They're, they are, look at how we could have laughed, but they, they are under the radar. Galway's win against Mayo was like a big statement win for them. There's talk of Galway winning Connacht Championships, trying to compete for all Ireland's in the power of choice. And Ross Cameron have just steadily gone under the radar. They beat Galway twice in the league, albeit look, one of the games was a bit of a dead rubber. They're back into Division 1. And I've always said, if this is an open, if this is like the league final, a Galway to go toe to toe Ross Cameron. I think Ross Cameron will win the game. I think that the, the Murtas, uh, Downey Smith, and the Smith, they've guys that will score, that will hurt Galway. If it's an open, free flow game, I think Gal- uh, Ross Cameron will win the game. If Galway get that defensive system right, like they did against Mayo, that edge in their play, that defensive organization, that structure that they have, they can shut down Ross Cameron and win the game. And that's, I expect them to play in a similar fashion. To how they lie down against Mayo, I think they'll get bodies back behind the ball and they'll try and break at speed using Colbert and Walsh um, to get scores. If they do that and they do it right, Galway will win the game. But if they go toe to toe and they say, listen, we're going to take you on the shootout, I think they're asking for trouble and the Rossies could nick it them. Do you think the Rossies have enough shooters in their arsenal? Do <laughs> they? Yes. That is the one thing Ross Cameron are not lacking. The issue with Ross Cameron, we feel, is that. Similar to Galway, like a Christmas we've had a Galway, that, that, there's no real edge to Roscommon. They, they don't shut teams down. They're, they're easy to play against. If you're playing Roscommon, you know you'll be in for a, a good game of football. It'd be great to watch, but they don't have that edge. They don't have that organisation at the back, I feel, to shut down teams. Um, and you they, felt, they, you've felt that for a decade, Paddy. How, how has that not changed? And I know it hasn't changed, because I know people in Roscommon, and it just hasn't. And it hasn't. And I'm looking at them through the National League as well. And it hasn't changed. I haven't seen anything from Anthony Cunningham to, to suggest that, like what we asked Galway to do against Mayo, with Keane O'Neill and Park Joyce and his management team to, to set up Galway to be dogged, to be hard to play against, to shut down an opposition. And Galway did it. We didn't know if they had it in their locker, but they did it against Mayo. Um, whereas Ross Common, I haven't seen anything like that from them. It, like I said, if it's a nice game of football, Ross Common are dangerous. But... The guys that can score, but I think defensively is the issue they've had that they're just too easy to play against. Yeah. The the one thing I have seen this year to to credit a change that Anthony Cunningham has made is he's settled with a midfield of Ulton Harney and Eddie Nolan, which has allowed the likes of Enda Smith to play further forward. Yeah. Instead of being in midfield and trying to do everything. And also allowed players like Nile Daly to play further back into a more natural position in the half back line. And I think Roscommon getting their best players in the best positions is probably very, very important for them to Maybe yep. eke another couple of percentages out. In their win against Roscommon, Donny Smith was kept relatively quiet. Connor Cox kicked six points. Enda Smith and Kieran Murthy kicked four apiece. Kim McKeown didn't kick a score. Carl Heenahan didn't score either. Um, and that's kind of how their scores are spread around. They got a couple of points off the bench then. Connor Daly, Dierma Murtha, uh, Niall Kilroy, um, Andrew Glennon getting a point as well. So when you were looking at that, when I was looking at that, I was wondering maybe, like, maybe they aren't getting enough of a tune out of their attack as well. But then when you look at that league final, I, I don't know, that league final was such a freak, it felt. <laughs> Galway. Like it, was, it, it wasn't a freak. That, that, is, that was a classic Galway and Ross Calvin match. Loads of great scores, guys kicking spinners, and it was great to watch. But if you're looking, or can either of these teams win in All-Ireland? No chance. That's, really? So it was a typical Galway-Ross Calvin game. What we'll see next Sunday is you're looking, can Galway kick on and 
use that defensive solidity that they used against Mayo? Can they go out and put a statement out, beat Ross Cobb and win the college championship, and then be serious contenders for All Ireland? Or can Ross Cobb and pull something out of the bag that we haven't seen from before? Like it, it won't be a massive shock if Ross Cobb win this game. No, it won't. No, not at all. But if it's just a free flow and lovely game of football down in Pierce Stadium, Ross Cobb could win it. But neither of those teams will have any say in the All Ireland. Are you expecting that, James? Are you expecting a free flowing game of football here? No, definitely not. What do you want to see? Well, that's not, not, not necessarily what I want to see, but like <laughs> if you think about how both sides are viewed in the country, right? Roscommon have beaten Galway. You could argue they've been slightly better throughout the year, right? But yet they're not seen as anywhere next or near our learning contenders. But we're saying that Galway could sneak in and have a cut off someone and maybe win it if they improve. So, like, it's hard to kind of get a, a full evaluation on both teams because we do seem to have a bit of a soft spot for Galway and kind of an expectation that they can go to a higher level. But will will Ross Common rise again? Like, I think that if you break both sides down, both defences aren't probably as set up as they could be. So... Do Ross Cameron have the man markers for Shane watching Comer? And do Galway have the man markers to stop the Smiths, the Coxes of this world? Like both sides are going to have to get bodies behind the uh, bodies behind the ball because I don't think they have those markers. So it could be a very, very slow paced game. I don't think it's going to be that nice game of football, Paddy, that you were saying. I think it is going to be yeah. slow paced. I, I, I hope it's not. For, for both of these teams to be serious about progression, it can't be like that. And, and if we're sitting here now, what we've seen this season today, neither of these teams are genuine all Ireland contenders. But we go out and see them next Sunday in Pierce Stadium, and go and we have an edge about them. They set up defensively, they hit uh, Ross Common on the break. That's a style of play that could go we could do damage. And the same with Ross Common. If Ross Common shows us something that they haven't shown us today, and all of a sudden, geez, they're dogging at the back and they're shutting down Galway, and then they attack a pace and they get the ball up to the likes of Cox and Burt and these guys, they can score. Then Ross Common are a serious team, mm. but I haven't seen it from them yet. Yeah. And if we're, if we're going now previewing this game, having what we've seen today from both those teams, I don't see them as All-Ireland contenders, either of them. Mm. And it's, it, James is right. It's around that if you're going in and serious about winning All-Irelands, you need defenders who can shut down the best players in the country. You need to be able to deal with Kerry. You need to be able to deal with Dublin. Need to be able to deal with the top top forwards, and I don't think either of these, these teams have the, the guys to do that. So they need a system and a structure to help them do that. We see the glimpse with Galway and the win over Mayo, and that was the impressive piece about them. But let's see how they line out next week, and let's see from Ross Common. Could nearly take a leaf out of Galway's book and adopt that style of play. I've never seen them do it. Yeah. So that's what they're going to need to do. I feel if they're going to be serious with winning the Connacht Championship. And having to say the All Ireland series, as Paddy mentioned, there it was the grit, James, that we were more impressed with in that Mayo game. There's always players with the, the kind of individual star quality, the Walsh, Comer, Conroy. Do you think they're going to carry them over the line in this kind of final? I think it'll be very close. I think that it could be a point or two either way. Okay, like if you read two, that's a fade, Jimmy. Who's going to win this game? Give it to me. Oh, we'll get, no, no, we'll get our predictions later. I think, I think we'll, we'll, we'll save I the think predictions that, for them later. You don't have to give <laughs> a name yet. I know they played a few, um, a few challenge matches and apparently are motoring very well. Um, so, like, I don't know what goal we have done since the Mayo game. Jimmy sources. Jimmy sources. Jimmy knows. Jimmy knows. So, like, if Ross Common have put enough work in, I think they can rattle Galway big style. Mm. Um, but it will come down to keeping the big fellas quiet. We always say, if you mark Shane Walsh, mark Comer, stop Conroy kicking points, yep. you have a chance. But I wouldn't read into those league finals at all. Yeah. If you saw the Kerry Mayo game, you could scratch that off. Yeah. Galway Roscommon was a lovely game. You can scratch that off. This is going to be a manic game. It might be slow paced, but it's going to be so physical. And yeah. I think that Roscommon have the little bit of a mental edge because I think that Roscommon see this as a bigger prize than Galway I think that Galway have kind of an eye on going further whereas I think that Ross Common the, the two things they could win this year are the league which they've won and the Connacht which is up for grabs yeah. I think that they'll, they'll go all out to win this game 
I'm pretty sure that any time in the last seven years that was common have won the Division Two league, they've also won. Under I, mean, I think so. I think that they've been aligned with each other. Or else they've been relegated and won in the same year. I'll have to check that one. Right, let's, before we, we'll come back for the predictions later on, let's move on to the Leinster final, Saturday evening, five o'clock. Kildare against Dublin. Last week, Desi Farrell said, Davy Byrne has a knee injury, so he's rehabbing at the minute. We're hopeful and optimistic. We've picked up a couple of injuries throughout the year, and at this stage, you throw everything at it to ensure you have an injury-free list and as many players available to you as possible. We'll be working hard with Davy and with a couple of others that we had today as well to get them back into the fray. So in the last couple of weeks, a lot of Dublin's injuries had cleared up. You've, we've started to see starting 15s in the championship that are putting a bit of fear into other counties probably looking on, do you know? Um, definitely they've had 11-12 of their best possible 15 playing in the last couple of games. Their starting back six against Mead was Comerford and Golds, which is very important. Uh, Merchant cornerback, Fitzsimons fullback, Lee Gannon cornerback. Howard played six, didn't he? With small yeah. small man, Mark and Killian O'Sullivan and James McCarthy wing back as well. So that yeah. was starting six. Johnny Cooper was on the bench and came in with about 20 minutes 49, 49 minutes on the clock. So yeah. we got about 20, 25 minutes. So we look at that Dublin defence. Do you expect any changes to that back six? I, I don't think so. You think they'll set up with Coward at six and, and Small? Uh, well, I think Small has got to work by McCormick. And okay. he, yeah, I think that'd be a very good battle. Uh, I think Fitzsimons has got to pick up Daniel Flynn. Okay. I think Merchant is made to work Jimmy Highland, um, and that leaves Lee Gannon and uh, and Kerwin in the other corner. So Kerwin, uh, uh, it's a mismatch, isn't it? Eleven shots the last day. That if if there was a change potentially, it could be Johnny Cooper starting instead of Lee Gannon. Uh, Lee Gannon didn't do a whole lot wrong though. So and would that be to combat like Kerwin's a big enough Gosson? Do you know would that be to combat yeah. the kind of size difference there? Uh, well, look, look Lee Gannon is a physical, he's relatively inexperienced at this level, but he's a physical player. Um, so if there was a change, potentially that might be it. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was pretty much the, the same 15 for Dublin starting so, the next. The big thing is Evan Comfort getting get back and go. Yeah. With kickouts. Kildare are going to put pressure on those kickouts. Um, and Evan is, he's very, very important that, that he was back uh, the last day. So. No, I, I think that'll be the matchups for Dublin. Um, Are we expecting back. McCarthy to pick up Paul Cribben? Yeah. Yeah, so and Lehiff will, will be in the middle of the field with Brian Fett. Yes, and I, I, I imagine Kildare, when you're saying they're going to put pressure on the coming for, for the kickouts, Kildare won't be afraid to compete when the ball goes long either, will they? No, no, we'll be Feely out there, Cribben around the middle as well. Like so. Callaghan, Flynn. Big men out yeah. there as well, yeah. Um, Look, you're right, but there's a mentality to me as well with Kildare this year. We see, we see it in Newbridge. We see even Glenn Ryan's comments after the last day. They are coming in. They fancy this game. Yeah. Not like last year's Leicester final where there was just a total sense. This sense of all to get it was like literally, let's just manage this game. Let's not get a height. There was no energy around Kildare. There was no buzz around it. It's very different this season. Very, very different. They fancy this game. So they'll push up. They'll be aggressive on kickouts. Like I say, they'll have Feely on Fenton. Kildare will take a backward step next week. Definitely not. Kildare started their front six last year, um, James. They started Ben McCormick, Conway, and Flynn in the half forward line. Neil Flynn, Daniel Flynn, and Jimmy Highland up front. And they had, I think they had David Highland playing as a sweeper with, they named an extra defender anyway in their half forward line and dropped them back. Do you think they'll do that again? Alex Burns started against Westmead. They obviously conceded quite a bit. We mentioned earlier on about Higgins playing that uh, defensive role from 11. Paul Murphy doing it for you guys back about seven, eight years ago up against Dublin. Are you expecting Kildare to do that again? Or are they going to go Are they going to go man for man? Like, you know, Howard, we're, we're looking at there. Brian Howard's a free man. What do you think they'll do? Alex Byrne might start again or a, a forward I, of some sort? Again, that Westmead game was played at training pace. Mm. Like, so if, if Kildare want to fix that, they just have to look inside their minds do you know they can fix that by talking about it i don't think they need to put in a defender Correct. they're actually drawing pressure on yourself from dublin by doing that i think the way to beat dublin is to go toe to toe with them and it has to be early on if kildare sit and wait for this game to come to them dublin will run out the gate in the first half like they have to play the game when it's at its most intense first 20 minutes lay down the marker there and then it doesn't have to be 10 all it can be two all 
But like that's when they have to play the game at the highest intensity. Yeah. That's when they can shake them. Because in the second half, when the intensity dies a bit and they're still in the game, they have brilliant forwards. Like they do. Those forwards are made for this. And I don't think Dublin's man for man. If I was Dublin, I'd be playing Cooper because I just think he's a brilliant player. But I don't know. Are Dublin's backs um, going to keep Kildare quiet for the whole game? So if Kildare can just hang in there in the first half and when the intensity comes, comes down a small bit, kick their score second half, I think they have a great chance. That's the, that's the big question though, isn't it? It's the, the issues Dublin had in the National League, and there was there was plenty of them, but, but one of the main ones was that defensive shape that they were they were being played through. It's conceded 11 goals in the National League. They've improved from that. They haven't really been tested. They weren't tested against Rexford. They definitely weren't tested against Mead. This will be a big challenge. Kildare have forwards who can hurt lots of teams and they'll be targeted. I said with the other end of the pitch, I don't think Kildare's Claire have the backs to deal with no. probably their full flow. Um, but the game will be won or lost. If if Cooper does start and brings that kind of experience, that, that defensive just nous that he has, and they shut down the Claire forwards, then Dublin will win this game convincingly. But that's the big question. And it's a big test for that Dublin defence, how they deal with because Claire are dangerous forwards, really, really quality players. Daniel Flynn didn't seem right in that game last year either. But there's a moment where he brushes off Mick Fitz. I think he goes back past Johnny Cooper on the inside his shoulder and buries into the back of the net. I don't think we've seen moments like that from Daniel Flynn this year. We've seen a, a little bit more of, a, more of a rounded performances from him. And he's been very impressive, I felt. Do you think he needs to do a bit more of the same, Paddy, in this in this Leinster final? Or like it's it's similar, like you with Shane Walsh with Galway as well. Flynn is like he is a phenomenal athlete. And he has massive talent. And he has moments in games um, like that last year. That goal last year was just, after that entire game, it was just a moment of magic. But there wasn't a whole lot else <laughs> from that in the, the game. And what Calera are looking for from him, he is probably their most talented player. It's can he give a 75-minute performance, can, like impact in the game. We know he can do the spectacular things. We absolutely know he can do that. But it's, can he win balls? Can he pop them off? Can he influence the game for the entire match? I thought he, and he, and he did that against Westmead. There was bits of play that they weren't outstanding. They weren't highlight reels, but they were yes. good, bringing players in. He drags defenders to him. Dublin will have to, like I said, I think Fitzsimons will pick him up. That's Dublin's best man marker dealing with him. If he can bring other guys into him, like he, for Jimmy Hyland's goal the last day, that's Daniel Flynn. He carries it through, squares the ball across for Jimmy Hyland, pams it to an empty net. They're, they're the type of things you're looking for from Daniel Flynn. A consistent performance across the entire game. Um, and, and look, look, if Kildare are going to do anything, if Kildare are going to win this game, he has to have a massive impact. If he's taken out of the game, if he's shut down by Dublin, Kildare aren't going to win this match. He's that important to them. So he got three points that day in, in Newbridge in their win, some big scores. Um, and Kildare, he's going to be, they'll be looking to him to lead the fight next week. Sorry for the noise there. I was just grabbing my match program from the Leinster final last year. James, there was a spell in that uh, Leinster final last year where Dublin had a couple of wides, Kilkenny had a couple of misses, Small had a couple of misses, and the game was still quite early on. Kildare kept the ball quite well for about seven, eight minutes. They missed eight shots in that spell. They dropped five short and hit three wide. And Ben McCormick kicked four of them wide. Yeah. Kicked four, missed four of them. McCormick's coming into this with a bit of form. Is that in Ben McCormick's head coming into this game that when push came to shove last year in Crow Park, I didn't name my chances? Or like, how, what sort of a mentality do you have? I think it's definitely not in his head, but sometimes when you lose a match, right, you can, you can overanalyze it. You can say, we need to do this. We need to do that. Sometimes you have to just say, I kick four whites. And if I didn't kick those four whites, we'd have been way more in the game. So you completely overanalyze. So McCormick's obviously gone away and his scoring rate this year has improved. Like he mm -hmm. got five, got five the last day. Like yeah, Cribben got one. You'd be hoping Cribben can, can, can chip in with two or three. Yeah. Um, yeah. Those fellas are accurate kickers. Then if you get, Kerwin has improves his rate from the last day. If he looked at himself the last day at the Westmead game, he can improve his efficiency. Definitely. There's always a goal in Flynn. And Highland and Merchant, I think that's not a bad matchup for Highland. I think he might have, he might have a chance to to get. I like that. I like Merchant for that one. 
It'd be interesting. It'd be interesting yeah. to see. It's a good battle. It will. It depends where the ball is coming from. Like if if Kildare are able to sustain the ball in Dublin's half and get and get Highland on kind of 20, 30 yard passes, I think he can cause trouble because he's strong. He's a good push off and he can win it out in front. But if they're if they're trying to get the ball in from too deep, I, I can't see it sticking then, do you know? Um, but I think the, the Kildare have scores in them. That's the interesting thing. Everyone else in Leinster, you'd just be saying Dublin are, just have too much scoring power. But I think the Kildare have improved that area. I think that's fair. I think that's, and I think it's going to be an exciting game. The, the spread is six points. Um, yeah. I don't I know if you think that's there plus six. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Dublin are going to win, though, lads. I have to say. It's it's Kildare's all Ireland final as well. Same as yeah. coming. Like Dublin are are thinking about a step and a process to getting their all Ireland status back. This is the time to catch them. Just when they think, yes, we're back. No, we played two good games in a row. This is when Kildare should be coming in and going. Here's your wake up. Do you know? I'll I'll struggle to back against Dublin this weekend, but I think the seven or eight minutes that you guys had last week, where you spoke about the shooting efficiency. And um, the chances that were missed by Mead, especially in the first half, and it led to a bit of panic seeping in. Mead did get goal chances. They got two very good goal, goal chances. chances yeah. A lot of poor wides. I just think if Kildare can click up front, and if, as James said, they go at it, they go at Dublin in the first 10 minutes, and we experience the noise of Newbridge, I know it's different, but Kildare will bring a good crowd with them to Crow Park. If they can yeah. get the fans with them in the first 10, 15 minutes, it is going to be spicy. I bet That's, you there'll be there'll be a fight early, guaranteed. Yeah, I'd say well, so. There's no point getting two lads sent off in the last five minutes. True. <laughs> um, Sunday, final game of the weekend in the provincial finals is going to be the Ulster final, which may well be the game of the weekend. It's Derry Donegal. It's in Clonus. Sean Hurston is the referee. Um, Declan Bonner reckons speaking during the week that the game isn't going to be decided until the final sprint. Paddy McBurty obviously kicked the buzzer beater last week or last year. We spoke about it last week, the battle he had at McKeg that day and he, he came up trumps, kind of echoes what James was saying earlier on about a forward only needing a moment to ruin a defender's day. Have you changed your tune at all since we were chatting last week? No, like, I think it's a really tight one to call. Um, like, like Derry have put back-to-back performances. They'll have serious energy. They'll be well-organised. They'll have a system to aim to shut down McBurty and Langan. They'll know... Donegal have an advantage of playing against the system because they've long-range point scores. Langan, Thompson, Murphy can all hit bobs 50 or outside the Derry press. Like, Derry will get bodies in around the D. They'll, they'll shut down that space. McBurty's not going to get a lot of possessions, I wouldn't have thought. Um, but... You counteract that by being well organized, by having guys that can punch holes. So that's like McFadden Ferry, uh, Old Ball Gallagher, Roy McHugh, and then you've guys that can kick long range points, which is what Donegal have. I ex- I think Donegal are going to win this one, lads. I think Derry will put it up to them, no doubt about it. But I just think Donegal have the weapons and the experience to get the job done next week. I think it's going to be unbelievably tight. I think. Again, very simple to kind of find. It wouldn't be a surprise if Derry win this. It would, be, it would be a brilliant story for Derry to come out of nowhere, have not won an Ulster Champs game in six years, and go and win the Ulster Champs by beating the three biggest teams in Ulster, in yeah. Tyrone, Monaghan, and then to beat Donegal in the final. I just don't think they're going to have it. I think Donegal have enough to get the job done next week uh, by a couple of points. It's, it's, it's all coming together for Donegal. Like they have essentially a full pick. All their pairs are back. I think Ocean Gallon reading during the week is the one who's a couple of weeks away he'd be a nice little option to have off the bench if to get him right but to have everyone else James and as we mentioned before and as Paddy is alluding to there they've appeared in 10 of the last 12 Ulster finals this is Derry's mm-hmm. first in a long time mm-hmm. how much of a factor does that have on the final this? day um, 2011 is the last Ulster final is it I thought it was 2009 so it was four, I thought it was 14 years 13 years how much is the does the occasion like of a of a an Ulster final in Clonus, how much of an impact does that have on the prep? You've got books like Connor Glass walking up for his first uh, Ulster final. That's a fellow who's played in the AFL. You've got Shane McGuigan who's played a massive game for Schlock Neil. You know, is he, they're not going to be intimidated by Clonus, are they? 
No, they're not. These fellas believe, like they have a serious belief behind them. They're going in to win that game. They're not going in going, oh my God, this is this is overwhelming. They they full on are going in to win this game and drive on. Um so in terms of experience, is it a big factor for, for Donegal? They might be the calmer kind of um side, but I think the Derry kind of operate off that kind of intensity anyway. They kind of go overboard in terms of intensity, which is the way they play. And it's so it's so their style. But <laughs> I just, I, for some reason, I find it very hard to back against Donegal. Do you know, I, as much time as I have for Derry, I think it'd be a very close game. The fact that Manon kicked 17 and left eight out there. They yeah. definitely left eight points out there. It could have been 25 points. I think that the Donegal are better up front than Manon from the half forward line, which is the areas the shots are going to come from. I don't think McBurty is going to get loads of shots if McCaig oh. picks them up. He's not going to get many. Is Jamie Brennan? We don't know. Murphy might drift out a bit, get some shots from outside. Then you're looking at Langan, Thompson, O'Donnell swinging over a few. They've they've probably been told in training, lads. If we get the chances, you have to have Dublin style conversion. Do you know? And if you do, we'll win the game. If you don't, we're going to be dragged into a serious battle. Paddy James is mentioning there Monaghan's missed opportunities. And again, we spoke about it last week when Monaghan put the squeeze on our religious kickouts. I think, I think I read Michael McMullen's stats. He's a journalist with Gaelic Life from Derry. I think he had the stat during the week that Lynch had 54% success rate. And I know a lot of teams are, are kind of looking at the longer kickout route as well this year. And, and Lynch has been looking at that. And the, there you've got a bit of joy. But Donegal are one of the best teams in the country to put a press yeah. on. Yeah, and look... See what they did to Armagh. And Armagh. Yeah, they, yeah. they actually weren't efficient with their shooting in that game, but they absolutely obliterated the Armagh kickout. That was awesome, yeah. In Bally Buffet. That's like Donegal are an experienced team. Like Declan Bonner's been around the block. This is what his fourth or fifth season with them. Mm-hmm. Guys like McBrady, Murphy, Roy McHugh, these guys have been around the block for the last decade. They'll have a system. It won't, certainly won't be any nerves or in awe of, of Derry or, or the occasion itself. They'll have a system to, to put pressure on the very kick out, um, and it can be a massive platform for them. Um, I, I just think with the experience they have, the, the form they're in, okay, they, they weren't great against Cavan, but they, that's the like typical Donegal, they just get the job done. Mm-hmm. It's a massive game for Donegal as well. It's a massive game, and, and if you're looking in terms of the overall campaign, the winners of this, we touched on it last week, it opens up for them. If you win the Ulster Championship, you are right in the mix as serious all the contenders the way they started to draw they played the Connacht winners and, and I, I just think Donegal are further down the road Derry are absolutely they've been the story of the championship so far um, but they're still quite early in their journey it would be a massive win for Derry and it, like I said, it would not be a shock if they won it but I just think Donegal that thing, like putting pressure on kickouts big guys around the middle McGee Murphy uh, McFadden these guys I just think they have the tools that will overcome Derry's game. But Paddy, if we're saying, right, and we said last week, Rory Gallagher, one of the best managers in the country, right? One of, yep. Definitely the best coach probably around, one of the best managers. He's looking at this, he's going, what are Donegal going to throw at us? Yeah, They're going to throw a press. <laughs> they're going to throw a watertight press. And yeah. they're not going to get away with, with, you know, hanging it up there. Yeah. So... I think they could have something saved or they could have had something prepared for this game yeah. that will just give them a bit of an edge. I'd be very surprised if they won the game at the same kickout level as um, the other week. Do you know, I think they're going to have to be better on it, but I think that Gallagher will have something. He has to. And, and fair point, lads, he always coached all these guys as well. He was with Tony God for years, so he knows them inside out. Yeah. He will have a plan for it, yeah. but he, w- will it be enough to secure possession on their own kickouts, breaking a pace. It, it's what they have to plan for, but being able to implement that on the day is, is the big ask for, for, for Derry. And I, I just, I don't know, I'd, like, I like Derry, I'd love to see them win it, but I just think Donegal will have a little bit too much. I get the sense from the body over the last couple of weeks that we were, we were coming to this, that we felt like Donegal would, would get here, but I still feel like you think Derry can do damage in the qualifiers. In saying that, when you're saying Gallagher has a plan, I fully believe it. This man yeah. has an Ulster in his crosshairs 
the whole time with this dairy group. And if he doesn't do it this year, he will believe he can do it next year. When he took over Donegal after McGuinness, off the back of 14, he lost Ulster finals to Monaghan and Tyrone in back-to-back years. He left down after 17, took over for Mana, lost another Ulster final to Donegal as for Mana boss. So, did, like, you know, there was two years there where he was favourites, a year when he was an underdog. This year is, is nearly he's perfectly primed to go in there now. It's an underdog with nothing to lose and everything to gain. So it, it's going to be an exciting game. And uh, whatever he has up his sleeve is going to be very, very interesting. But if you listen sometimes to some of the top managers, they say that they like to have something held back and a kick out yeah. to focus training and to surprise the opposition. So, I mean, does Orrin Lynch have a boomer? Like the boomer is one way over a press. If you can yeah. boom it just past midfield and get a flick on it, it's a goal chance on the other side. I mean, have they practiced that? Or is it a case that they're going to chip it and try and run it out with Rogers? Like that's a dangerous, dangerous play. I think if we haven't seen the boomer yet, it may not be there. It may not. I don't think he has the range of a Morgan or a Megan where he can or a Patton. 65 Patton. yards over the press. Um, Patton's a standard setter for it, isn't he? Yeah, well, uh, Patton. Uh, Beggar and Morgan are the guys that you put 10 guys up into the opposition half they'll kick over and then yeah. you're wide open at the back so it's, it's high risk but yeah. I think I think Donegal will have an edge there Okay so I'm going from possibly what we'll say is the most competitive provincial final of the weekend to Killarney and Fitzgerald Stadium and this isn't so much a slight on Limerick but more where we the esteem we hold Kerry in at the moment and the form they brought coming into this game Division 1 champions they swept Cork aside when they had to in the last 20 minutes. Their superior physicality and skill level definitely showed. Limerick have had two big wins, an epic win over Clare on penalties, which would have completely galvanised the group if it ever needed it. They've got promotion out of Division 3 and they've beaten Tipperary now, um, where in previous years when they've been close to tip, they've fallen just fallen short. So Limerick have earned their right to play in the Munster final. James, how can we preview this game? Like... Is there any holes that we can look at? Not re- like it, I'm struggling. I was trying to think for coming into it. Like I'm, I d- like I think the Kerry will win, but it's it will be a good sign of where they're at. Like I think the Billy Lee will have the boys in Limerick absolutely hopping in that dressing room. Like to be involved in the monster final down in Killarney, it's just it's a chance, it's an opportunity, a shot to nothing. They're not expected to win. It's a free hit. And they can go out with no pressure and just tear into the Kerry lads. It'll be interesting. Like, Kerry weren't good against Carr, realistically. For 15 minutes, it was nearly touch and go. Like, you did expect Kerry to pull away, but they looked rusty. They didn't look themselves. So they need this game, and they need to go at it fully. They need to go at it with their best team and get that chemistry back. Because the fixtures haven't done them any favours in terms of the league final and to know they yeah. had nothing, you know. Like if they don't put together a performance here and they get a tough quarterfinal draw, they're, they're, there's question marks. It's like it's so easy the way it does change. You can go from nothing can touch you to a couple of dodgy performances. You haven't got back to that level after a break. Then you get a bad draw and you're feeling the pressure. So I think that Kerry need to go out here and lay down, lay down a marker. Have you ever had a monster final that you were expected to win that you started slowly? It doesn't strike me that well, you... Do you know what money. we did one year and we just talked about kickouts. We played Clare in a Munster Championship game down at Clare and we pressed them on a kickout and it worked an absolute treat. And yeah. the game was over. Do you know, th- like that was it. The game was over after that. We just brought something different to the table and it just gave us a confidence level going on then. So, I mean... Have we ever started slowly? Of course. But mm. like, do you think there's a danger it's going to happen again? The cork, the cork performance. I think that yeah, I think there's definitely danger of it. I think Limerick are better than Cork, and I think that they also don't have the pressure that Cork had. Like Cork were completely written off and almost humiliated by their own. Whereas Limerick are being, you know, they're being praised and they're saying just go in there, lads, and have a, have a free shot. So absolutely, I think it's a dangerous one for Kerry. I still expect them to win. I think their forwards are going to be too good, but it'll be a, a good insight into their mentality to see how they come out of it. First half will tell a lot. If it's a close first half um, and you're going into second half again with 10 minutes to go and you're needing fellas to come off the bench to win it for you, it's probably not a good look for Kerry. 
Paddy, Saturday evening. What are you yeah. hoping to see on the pitch? Don't lie, um, to, don't lie to us. You want to see Benzema scoring at this time. <laughs> I have a busy Saturday. Champs League final is not till 8 o'clock. So uh, okay. I'll be watching these games in Paris. Um, what do I want to see from Kerry? Like a ruthless performance. A ruthless performance that they go out, they dominate the kick out. Derwin O'Connor, Jack Barry, these guys in the middle. Clifford, Sean O'Shea back to their best. Steve O'Brien was very impressive the last day. I just think Kerry have way too much firepower. The job Billy Lee has done with Limerick, the progression they've made into Division 2, in a Munster final, have kind of beaten two, two tough games to come through mm. against Clare, the win against Clare and win against Tip, both away from home. Uh, it's been a brilliant season to date for Limerick, but the, the quality and the firepower Kerry have, they're going to win this game. And, and I want to see them win it convincingly. Um, and that's look, I, I think out of all the provincial finals, this is obviously the, the most straightforward one. Uh, yeah. I, I carry to a pretty handsome, yeah. Okay, let's move on to our predictions. We have 11 games, it's going to be hard to keep a track of this oh. one. Last week, just to clarify, Paddy went Wicklow Offaly, yes, Wicklow Offaly, Donahue went Waterford Offaly. Terrible call, okay. Well, I you have to back one outsider. Or the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, to be honest, I, I nearly <laughs> those always wins, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, provincial finals. We've done all the previews quickly now. Galway Ross Common, James. Oh, you had to go to me first. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, give it to me, Jimmy. Come on. It's so hard to call, like like the home advantage. <laughs> <laughs> it does just, if it does, just go a home advantage. It does, it does come into it. I mean, Roscommon definitely have a lot of work done. It's a bigger game for them, I think. That I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Galway to win it all. Harry, yeah, Galway. I'm going Roscommon. Said it a couple of weeks ago. Donegal Derry. Donegal. Donegal. Yeah. I'd say that I'd love, I'd like to see Ross Cobbett and Derry win, but I don't think so. Of course, no. Um, yeah, I think Donegal's not. Uh, Dublin Kildare. Nail on. Nail on. Nail on. Nailed how on. you can Nailed be on. so confident. I just don't know how you can be so rock solid. Yeah. You can't be that impressed with how they performed against Mead. No, Mead were catastrophic, but I, I think Dublin, Dublin are going to win this game. 100%. Jimmy, don't be giving this. Wally. Home advantage as well. Sorry, Croker. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's neutral. Uh, sorry, yes, I'm sorry. If it was in Parnell Park, I'd take it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I really am looking forward to that game. I think that the Kildare should give them a good rattle, but I do expect Dublin to come through. But I don't think they'll break the six point barrier. I think it'll be it'll be three or four points max. Good. Tommy, come on. I can't do it. I'm gonna go with Dublin. I just think, yeah, you're right. I think Dublin are in the groove. Yeah. And Kildare maybe just missing one or two defenders at the minute. Definitely is where Kildare are gonna come unstuck, I feel. Yeah. Unless they have a plan for number 10. And have something up up their sleeves that throws a spanner in the works, and I don't know whether that's how possible. We'll move, we'll move on. Kerry Limerick, are we going? Kerry, Kerry, Kerry. Yes. Right now, the interesting games in the Touching Cup. Cavan down, Breffney Park, two o'clock, round one of the Northern Group. Cavan, all day, all day, all day, all day long. You have to go. But is Brad a good player with Dale, Is he? I actually think <laughs> Kilku, the two, one of the Kilku lads that were in the squad has left since Bronny and Cole. Oh, so, uh, he's Kaelan, thrown out. <laughs> Kaelan Mooney left. <laughs> Bob the belt. No, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't thrown out, but he, he left on his own accord. Cavan are going to win that one, lads. Cavan are favourites for that talent. Yeah, I think Cavan have, Cavan have some ballers there. Yeah. You know, Lynch, Gallagher, Gallagher. Smith, they were just yeah, they're impressive. Operating at a very high level the last day, so I'm going to go with Kevin as well. Yeah, down lost five players after a beating by Monaghan. McAvoy, Jared Collins, Charlie Smith, Corey Quinn, and Kaylon Mooney have left the squad. So it's, it's hard. It's hard to back down there. Um, they're seven to one on as well. Yeah, they should just. They are. Yeah, and Kevin were impressive. 
Cavan were impressive against Donegal. That went down to the wire. So I think we're going Cavan, Cavan, Cavan. This game is live in GA Go. It's in Carrick and Shannon. It's Division 3 Antrim and the McGinley and Stephen mm. O'Neill at the helm against Andy Moran's <laughs> Leitrim. It's live on GA Go, so you can stream it. I streamed Wexford Offley today. Enjoyed it. A very competitive game. Leitrim. Are you back in Leitrim to beat Antrim? Go, yeah. Lee Fellow Tubi's book, the whole advantage. Um, I, it's tight. Like, Antrim are probably favourites for us, aren't they? I would yeah. say. I'd have to check that. Antrim favourites, four to seven. It's hard to look uh, oh, I'm back in Andy. I'm back in Andy. I'm back in Leitrim. In Carrick and Shannon, it'll be a big crowd. This is the type of game that the Talta Cup is brought in for. Yeah. It's, big it's a big game for both of them. Um, it should be a brilliant game. Um, but I, I wasn't impressed with it. I watched Antrim against Cavan. Um, they, were, they were poor now. They were poor, but they didn't have enough to beat, get over Leach. I, I, I just think Leach were going to nick this one in Carrick and Shannon. I'm going to go with you. I think this. I think Leach will win it at home. I think there'll be a savage atmosphere there. Yeah, there'll class. be an expectancy as well. In a I good way, be, no, be, they want to be, go and see them win. There'll be a buzz in Carrick, and uh, I am not going to curse our old buddy Andy Moran. I actually think this one's going to go to extra time, and Antrim are going to win it. Oh, Wowzers! So I actually think it's going to end the wire. I think it's going to be. I think what you said there about it being <laughs> the game of the round in the Touching Cup. It's two counties who are traveling across the country, haven't really seen each other. Um, they haven't played against each other. There's a bit of an excitement about it, so that's going to be an exciting game. So. Apologies to the people of Leitrim and Andy Moran, but I hope it's a great game. I hope you do win it, but I do think Antrim are going to get the job done. I think we just, I think there's too much up there. Uh, Longford for Mana, Pierce Park, Longford of home for uh, advantage, 5 30 p.m. Um, these two faced each other in Division Three. Pretty sure they faced each other in a couple of challenges in the last couple of weeks. What way would you be leaning? Who won the challenges? I'll, I'll give you the favorite. <laughs> um, for men, I'd be favourite for that. For men, are 4 7, yeah. For men, are good for about 40, 45 minutes against the Uh It was a long time ago, so they haven't played. Um, I think Longford are going to nick that one. Yeah, I do too. Longford are, yeah, Longford are a good qualifier team. Yeah. Oh, they've always had a couple of wins in them. Although, actually, they nearly beat Kerry in all night. <laughs> they did. Yeah. Yeah. But even even beyond that, they had, they've always had a couple of, they've had a result up their sleeve whenever they got into the qualifiers or performance or two. Offensive quickly to be to kick for mana to victory. Yeah. I'm gonna change that one. I'm gonna go for mana as well. No, 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 no. You stuck now. First I name on. <laughs> I might. Okay. All right. Okay. 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 Well, It'll be close. It'll be a good game. Uh, next one: Sligo London, Markovic Park. London had a very impressive league campaign. They were beaten late on one. by 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 Leitrim, but they came back. They're eight points down at one stage, ten minutes to go, and London brought it back to a point. Leitrim held on with a late goal. One up by four, I think. Sligo obviously were pushed to the pin of their collar against New York. Sligo do have some very talented footballers: Sean Carabine, Niall Murphy, Pat O'Connor. They're gonna nick this one, lads. That's yes. why, yeah, we're gonna go with London. Just I thought they were impressive with Division Four. There's a bit of momentum behind them. They nearly nicked it. They nearly beat Leitrim over Ryslip, but um, this is my upset of the weekend. I think London could go to Markovic Park and get a win against Sligo. Wow. Because yeah. we just don't know go. how much work London have done since, yeah, since yeah. losing. You see, that's the only um, question mark. When you ask that question, James, I have a feeling that this group of London footballers, they have, they have a homegrown coach in Michael Maher, who's 32. There's a serious amount of enthusiasm around what they've got yeah. up there in Ryslip. They have a good group. They seem to love what they're at. Their captain is a London-born lad, Liam Gavigan. A couple of talented footballers across the board. You're hardly going to go with Paddy on this one, are you? I'm thinking about it. I need to, I need to, to I'm win going, this weekend, though. I'm going to go Finish. with... <laughs> Go on, go on, you go first. Go on, go on you go first. I think it's like I think it's like a win in this game, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think Sligo probably have it up front on them. I think their score is in them. Um, home advantage. Home advantage as well, of course. London travelling. It's a long, long weekend for them. Yeah, I'll go Sligo. Okay. Paddy, just to let you know, uh, Sligo were one to five on. Not that you care about Ooh. what the book yeah, is okay. saying. No, no, okay. no. Sunday in the Southern Division. Cullen Park, Carlo against Tipperary, two o'clock. Carlo of home advantage. What way are we going with this one? Tip all day. Tip, tip, tip. Tip for me, yeah. 
Tip, tip, tip. Yeah. Okay. Tip will, be, tip will be looking at this to win this competition. Wicklow have played very well this year. Since uh, Alan Costello came in halfway through the league, replaced Colin Kelly. They're away to Offaly, two o'clock on Sunday. Offaly. This is easy. I, I'm going I, for Wicklow, lads. I think Wicklow are going to beat Offaly this weekend. Yeah, I think Wicklow are going to beat Offaly. I've that watched Offaly. I've, I've watched Offaly in the first game, Division 2, against Clare. I wasn't impressed with them. I think they were lucky to get by Wexford today. I watched that game. I think Wicklow are going to beat them. You see, what these teams haven't had before is momentum in terms of getting from round to round because they've been knocked out of championships. Mm. So we don't really know how much they're going to actually respond to even winning this weekend. I mean, that was a huge result. So I think that Offaly will generate some serious support for that game. Yeah. They'll, they'll put a lot into it. Even um, they get bosses down. They'll have nice little kids there like they did for the Miners and Hurley. I think that Offaly will win that. Okay. Yeah. Last game of the weekend. A bit of a derby. Leash Westmead, Amora Park, two o'clock. Westmead. Yeah, definitely. Cert. Westmead Leash, as well. Leash, Westmead uh, are one of my favourites for, for the Leash are a bad place, lads. This the season's just kind of unraveled for them. There's no momentum behind them. Westmead. I know I didn't think they were great against Kildare, but they got it within three points. Uh, I think they'll win this game. They kicked two fifteen like against Division yeah. One. Yeah. You know, like that is that is great to see. Like to see that and scoring like, ability. You know, Heslin was quiet yeah. as well, Jimmy. Like you'd always associate with Westmead and everything went that Heslin's yeah. gonna be to the four. He was actually quiet the last day. The guys like Ray Canellan, Sam McCartan kicked some lovely scores. I think he got four for play against Calair. I just think they'll have too much for Leash. Leash Leash are struggling badly. Yeah. Just gonna give a shout out to James Costello from Galway. You know who you are, you're looking for a shout out on the football pod this week. Um I I did meet him in Smith's Ranla last night. Oh, hello. As uh, I was getting around the drinks. They weren't all for me. Um, I was at oh, a 30th birthday party. Jack Madden wants to know, will an early Donegal press on kickouts counteract Derry's ability to start fast? We have spoken about this. Yeah. It could. It could. Like, if, if, if Oran Lynch is pinned in and he has a wobbler, Donegal will sniff blood and they'll go for it. Yeah. And when they did that press um, against Armagh, they were kicking whites. They yeah, kicked they a lot of whites. Well. Like Langen, Langen had maybe three or four in the first half. Thompson had one or two maybe. They were just weren't efficient enough. But if they can actually convert with that press, I think yeah. it'll it'll be very hard. To, I think for the big area that Donegal will focus on and it, and it could swing it in their favour as well. Okay. This is a bit of a, a random one. James is going to throw it at you. David O'Connell wants to know, how did James develop the opposite hand to opposite foot soloing? Is that something you would have done much of? It, I found it so much more natural. It so is, much more. Left, the two. Right. It goes against the coaching manual, James. Yeah, it does. And I actually discussed it with Chris Flannery, our coach at the Legion. He was in McCurry a couple of years ago. And he was teaching left hand, left foot, right hand, right foot. Like the way you're running, you're... Your right hand and your left leg kind of come up together for a nice yeah. solo. And if you see the if you see the best ball carriers, they're all opposites. It's awkward looking sometimes, unless if you're running down the sideline. Say you're running down the left hand sideline and you're soloing left to left because you have to hand someone off with your yeah. right hand. That's obviously that's brilliant to have. But in terms of going at speed. Opposite, I'd be coaching opposite, definitely. Did, did you get much grief from coaches when you were younger for doing it like that, James? No. Plus, the ball doesn't travel half as far. Like, when you're going left to left, the ball is out of your control. Here. Your, I, I the the ball is out of your control. If, if it, one of the kids that doubled the fifth age was doing that, he'd be bobbed out. He's gone. What? Back to the club. <laughs> Andrews, I don't believe yeah, get it. Get out of here. I thought we were all about encouraging flair and a bit of individuality on this no. podcast. That's poor technique. Are you joking? <laughs> Go on, Jim. At the Master Shay was a good man for his analytics. Like, so. Yeah. It worked for the lads fair enough. But. Why did you start doing it? Do you know why you started doing it? No. Because it just felt more natural. Like I didn't say, do you know what I might try now? Is that opposite? It just <laughs> felt more natural. When you're going to pace. Clifford does it. <laughs> Cliff does it as well. Jesus. All right. I'll have to read it. It's very common down here, but. Yeah. 
I just try and think of good ball yeah. carriers around. Yeah, I, it, it's the distance. It's out of your control. Like if you're actually running, I kind of run maybe a bit more bent over, kind of hunched, which means my hand is closer to my leg. I can, know? Picture, so it, I can picture it. It's not actually that big a solo anyway. You're but, only a little fella anyway. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Nice low center of gravity, but would it's actually yeah? I think not many Dublin fellas do it at all, do they? None of our lads do that <laughs> because they're corrected. <laughs> We're all robots, like. robotic. <laughs> I can see it being coached out of fellas, but I I just think that if it feels more comfortable, absolutely no reason to not do either way. And did you ever felt? I know you had two feet, but did it ever feel like you were bamboozling a defender by running at him like that? No. I no, don't think it, don't make don't even make a difference. No. Okay. The only thing it was it was more comfortable for me. Okay. Okay. Um Joshua Tool and Senna Murphy have similar questions. Can Kildare finally win Leinster? And if Kildare are to beat Dublin, what do they need to do? They need to close the back door. That's what they need to do. Um, if they could shut down Connor Callahan, Kirk Kennedy, Corbett Costello, they could win the game. But I don't think you know what's similar to Ross Cobbett in a way. I'll need to see something from Kildare that we haven't seen to date. There's no doubt they'll have a plan. Glenn Roy and Anthony Rainbow, those guys. But I just think, I think Dublin will have too much firepower for Kildare. That's why I'm confident Dublin will win this game. But if Kildare are going to win it, they'll need to be able to shut down that Dublin attack. And I, I don't know if they can. I think Kilkenny has taken the bit between his teeth as well, hasn't he? He looks he's like... He's the last day, yeah. Five yeah. The, um, he's leading. Yeah. He has to. He needs to. Like and if he does everything, but if he can contribute five points from play from half forward, and like is absolutely invaluable. Yeah. If you're thinking, if you're thinking, holding an eleven up high, he's the the ultimate. I know the Dublin aren't playing that way at the moment; they're playing him twelve. But just to think down the line, maybe on a Kerry with Morley sitting, and there's someone like a Kilkenny in that role, maybe high up on, on in the eleven. And he going well, that will be a great thing to see, a great battle. Yeah. But I know they're playing him 12 and it's suiting him at the moment. Finton Keown sent us a photo in the week, listening to the football pod with my coffee in hand with a view of the Mediterranean from Palma de Mallorca in Spain. Ooh, very nice. Yeah, so send us in a photo wherever you are listening to the pod around the world. Oshin Murta said, any plans to bring the pod to Cavan? Well, Oshin, alongside New York, uh, Canada, Chicago, Cavan will hopefully be on the list for 2023. Um, and a final shout out. Dara says Niall McNamee deserves a shout out. And of course, we pay tribute to Niall McNamee later on. So um, as we mentioned, we are in Mayo on June the 2nd, our first live road show as a podcast. It's going to be a, an event in the night. We're going to have great crack. Keith Higgins is going to be our special guest. We're going to have loads of fun. Um, we'd hope to see you all there. Just to finish off, lads, our fantasy football teams, you'll be glad Ooh. to know that as the Premier League season comes to a close, you still have a bit of fantasy football to play. A transfer window is opening at Tuesday morning at 11 a.m. You are allowed four free transfers to your team. Four. You max three players from each county. There's 11 games this weekend. A three or two two players each county? Oh, no, yeah. three up to three, three, is it? You can change now. You have a max of three players from each but county. Throw lads out, do yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thrown. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's the qualifiers, you know. They they've got them coming up too, like so. Um, yeah. So that's that's the one thing. Is there any players you'd be having your eye on, James, to get in at the minute to come in? Yeah, I'll, I'll call out. I don't your... have many carry lads. Um, I fancy this weekend they might put up a score. Um, just, on this, does the Talton Cup count into this? No, Sam. Oh, no, no, it's Sam. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, so you have a to do damage, but. James, you have got a front six of Walsh, Mulroy, Highland, McBrearty, Coslow, Murphy. You've got Enda Smith and Paul Conroy in your midfield. Mm. Do you know where you'd be looking to make changes? Well, Mulroy can come out. And I think Kilkenny would be a good man to go in there. Yeah. Uh, I think he has the uh-huh. beat. Uh, Sean Shea would be another man. He's going to kick points for the rest of the championship. Um, who else? I mean, Shane McLaughlin obviously is one, but we'll see how this weekend goes first, I suppose. Shane it's McGregor. Next, it's next, or sorry, Shane McGregor. It's next Tuesday, isn't it? The, the transfer it's, window? It's, yeah, Tuesday. The day the pod is out, Tuesday morning, 11 a.m. You can make your transfers up until the Saturday. 
they'll come in to play for the next two weekends. Paddy, you've got Ryan O'Donoghue. You'd have to wait a week for that qualifier game. Sean O'Shea, Jimmy Highland, Shane Walsh, Dean Rock, David Clifford. And you have Fenton. Fenton and Enda Smith in your forwards. Yeah. Would, you know, Paddy's at a decent start. Paddy's got 375 points so far. Yeah, you know, yeah. yeah James, though, is much further ahead. Oh, okay. hey. it's, geez, leave it out. <laughs> James is four four five. I oh, don't worry. I'm, like, I'm way behind. Well, as well. Like, don't worry. Got heckled me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, would you uh, have you anyone your eye on? Any clear forwards you're going to bring in, or you're going to leave Highland in there? I'm behind you, by the way. No, I'm happy. I'm, I'm happy with my lot. That's a bit of lovely. Right. That is it for this week's episode of the Football Pod. Thank you very much for listening in. It has been brought to you as always with thanks to AIB, proud sponsors of the Senior Football Championship. Do check out hashtag the toughest for more we will be chatting next week lads but we're gonna have to do a shorter pod because we've got a second podcast coming out later in the week after our road show you've got to be there on the night to experience the show live we'll be putting out a snippet from the show on the friday ahead of the weekend but on the thursday night thursday june the second in castle bar if you're anywhere around if you're going to be down there it's the weekend that i've been called the weekend come and join us we can't wait for it so that's on the horizon for next week so we have a lot of prep to do for that you boys have a busy weekend ahead okay. in your own lives. We have a lot of football to catch up on as well. So I look forward to chatting to you next week. Enjoy the week. Thank you all for chatting. Cheers, Tommy. And thanks for everyone lads. listening at home. Cheers, folks. Bye-bye. See you later.